Seeing no further introductions, it's therefore time for member statements. The member from Elgin Middlesex, London. Thank you very much. Speaker, Speaker, I rise today to acknowledge World Diabetes Awareness Day. The diabetes epidemic in Ontario and Canada is rapidly growing and needs government attention more now more than ever. Fortunately, this government has chosen not to renew a diabetes strategy. There are two main types of diabetes, individuals with type 1 diabetes who are unable to produce their own insulin, and individuals with type 2 diabetes, the most common form, who do not produce enough insulin. Currently, there are 11 million Canadians living with diabetes or pre-diabetes. This number grows daily, with another Canadian being diagnosed every three minutes. In Ontario alone, there are roughly 4.7 million people who have diabetes or pre-diabetes. Type 1 diabetes can't be prevented or delayed, but there is hope that through research and innovation, a cure can be found someday. Early detection of diabetes can potentially decrease complications and improve quality of life. I encourage all Ontarians to visit diabetestest.ca or take the CAN risk test. Taking this test helps individuals become more aware of diabetes risk factors. Those at higher risk will be encouraged to see their doctor or pharmacist to learn more. I want to thank all of the dedicated healthcare professionals that assist in diabetes treatment and prevention, as well as Diabetes Canada, for all the terrific work they do in our, our province and country. Thank you. Thank you. Senior member statements from member from uh, Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. A couple of weeks ago, I had the pleasure of meeting with the Child Welfare Political Action Committee, a group of individuals who are determined to see better outcomes for children in our child welfare system. And, Speaker, they know what they speak of because they themselves have lived experience in the child protection system. When a child is taken into care by the province, we become their parents, but too often we let them down because their outcomes leave a lot to be desired. Typically, when youth leave care, they have lower academic achievement. They experience poverty and homelessness, early parenthood, and involvement with our criminal justice system. They have poor physical and mental health, and they are left to face the world alone. The Child Welfare Political Action Committee wants that to change, and that they believe that they can change that by focusing on evidence-based policies, evidence collected by tracking the experience of our youth when they age out of our system, evidence that tells us what works and what doesn't work and what needs to change to ensure youth living in care have skills to thrive as adults. Speaker, we must do better for the children and youth in our care. I commend the Child Welfare Political Action Committee for their dedication in doing just that. Thank you. Thank you. For the member of the statements, the member from St. Catharines, Chief Government Whip. It gives me great pleasure to welcome here today the individuals I did. Myositis is an extremely rare chronic autoimmune disease affecting an estimated five out of every 10,000 across Canada. <coughs> Myositis is undue inflammation of muscle that often results in muscle damage to key organs. Symptoms of myositis include difficulty walking and standing, trouble swallowing and breathing, muscle pain and soreness. This disease is poorly understood and patients do not always respond to the oral and expensive intravenous medications prescribed. It is often a precursor to certain cancers. It is not contagious and it is not hereditary. It does strike every age, every ethnic background, and both sexes. Its causes are unknown. As a result, this leads to an extreme lack of awareness and how to appropriately identify and diagnose myositis within the medical community. For patients specifically, the extreme lack of coordination of health care services, medical, rehabilitative, occupational, psychological supports for themselves and their families can be extremely frustrating. Myositis is poorly recognized, poorly resourced, and patients and their families have few, few places to turn to. With any critical illness, it takes a network of medical, physical, and psychological supports. Having said this, patients are the ones who can best address the challenges they face in accessing myositis care within the health care system through their shared experiences. This important initiative brings patients together and empowers them to advocate for improved awareness, education, and financial resources to better manage their disease. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Bruce Gray and South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Today, I rise in recognition of the men and women who selflessly devoted their lives to preserving the freedom which we so gratefully enjoy today. I had the honour of attending a special event at the Owen Sound Royal Canadian Legion and organized by the Billy Bishop Museum, where we recognize local veterans who have fought and devoted their lives in wars that have spanned our timeline since World War I. 
I want to personally recognize the 11 veterans who made this year's list. William Avery Bishop, who holds the highest number of victories for his role as a pilot in World War I. Wallace Wally Frederick Edwards, a leading air craftsman for the Royal Canadian Air Forces in the Second World War. Winifred Darby Gardner, a private and responsible for communications at Camp X and the Secret Service during the Second World War. Leslie Allison Gosling, a sergeant in the Royal Canadian Air Force and a fighter control operator during the Cold War. Peter Kipp joined the Army at just 17, where he worked as a private during the Second World War. Glenwood Roy Lees, a captain in the Royal Canadian Air Force during the Second World War and the Cold War era. James Duncan MacArthur, an air craftsman in the Royal Canadian Air Force in the Second World War. Robert Thomas James Mitchell, a corporal in Afghanistan and involved in Operation Medusa. He died in Afghanistan on October 3, 2006. Timothy Adam Northcott was a sergeant in Afghanistan. Peter Reinders, a sergeant in the Royal Netherlands Army Post, Second World War. And Benjamin James MacArthur Watson, a master corporal in the Canadian Army in Afghanistan. And Mr. Speaker, it's a true privilege. We had a 103-year-old veteran there, Charlie Fisher, who ordered a new iPad. <laughs> Honouring the veterans of local communities has been a long-standing tradition in Canadian culture and is a unique opportunity to reflect and grow from past conflicts and show our gratitude to those who helped to secure our freedom. Thank you to all veterans in Bruce Gray Owen Sound and across our province and our country, as well as to those across all of our nations. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. For the member's statements, the member from Timiskaming Cochrane. Thank you, Speaker. It's the time of season. It's actually it's the time for winter driving. And I'd like to talk about a few things that people all over the province, but specifically in Northern Ontario, are experienced. So last Thursday, my wife and daughter were coming back from the Royal Winter Fair. They called the North Bay. The weather was good. Then they announced the road was closed. There's no cell service. So for a half an hour, 45 minutes, I was like so many other Northerners. I didn't know where my family was. I knew they were on a road somewhere that was closed in Northern Ontario. Luckily, they actually made it to Tomogamy and they slept at the Tomogamy Inn. But, but all people throughout Northern Ontario suffer through that a lot. And we push for better road winter maintenance and we continue to do that. But there's another issue. The next morning I was going on the same road going south and the road was bad but, and traffic was crawling and a transport passed our line of traffic with other traffic coming towards us. And I'm sure the people in facing me, I'm sure their heart was in their mouths because mine was. And I couldn't believe the risk that transport driver took. And I will never forget watching his taillights and the sign on the back of his pipe load that said oversized load. Most truck drivers are extremely conscientious. But it takes everyone to make a safe road, and that's the MTO, the politicians, and the people on the road. We all have to be careful because we have other people's lives in our hands. Thank you. Thank you. Member statements. The member from Brampton, Springdale. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The province of Ontario proclaimed the month of November as Hindu Heritage Month, recognizing the important contributions that Hindu Canadians have made to Ontario and Canada. This bill was introduced in the Ontario Legislature by my colleague and friend, MPP Joe Dixon. Brampton Springdale and the province of Ontario are home to more than 700,000 Indo-Canadians, with 1.2 million Indo-Canadians living in the country. In Brampton, the proclamation of Hindu Heritage Month in 2017 was recognized by two residents from, was initiated by two residents from my riding, Manand Gupta and Rakesh Joshi, on behalf of the Canadian Hindu Association. A flag raising ceremony was held at the city of Brampton earlier this month with members of the community and the Can Canadian Hindu Association to launch the month-long activities. Brampton, Springdale and the province are home to a large and vibrant Hindu community. Since the first Hindu immigrants arrived in Canada at the beginning of the 20th century, Hindu Canadians have made significant contributions in Ontario. They continue to help foster growth, prosperity and innovation throughout the province. By proclaiming the month of November as Hindu Heritage Month, the province of Ontario recognizes the important contributions that Hindu Canadians have made to Ontario's social, economic, political and cultural fabric. I am proud that this government passed the bill proclaiming November as Hindu Heritage Month in Ontario that gives, us all, gives all Ontarians an opportunity to remember, celebrate and educate future generations about Hindu Canadians and the important role that they have played and continue to play in communities across Ontario, Canada and around the world. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any further member statements? Um, let me see. The member from Oxford. Mr. Speaker, this is Bullying Awareness and Prevention Week. Bullying is happening in our schools 
on our playgrounds and on our electronic devices. We need more discussion on what we can do to stop it in our communities. As more and more children use social media and cell phones, bullying online has grown. So it doesn't stop when children leave school. It's affecting them around the clock. When I've spoken to students, I've heard that cyberbullying is even more common in schools than in-person bullying. Today, we are facing new challenges. There are so many social media websites that can be used as a venue for bullying, it can be difficult to keep track of them all. But this issue doesn't just impact you. We've all seen hateful comments online. We have all need to be reminded to those be reminded to those of us to talk with how to talk with both people in person and online with respect to kindness and we need to say something when we see bullying take place. It takes a strong person to reach out to someone in need and build them up. But it takes real courage for those who are victims to ask for help. To people who are impacted by bullying know that there are people who care about you and who can help you if you have been bullied. I encourage all members this week and every week to stand up against bullying. We can reduce bullying. We can work together and make our communities places where everyone is accepted and respected. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Scarborough Southwest. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to rise to the House today. I'm going to read a poem to mark Remembrance Day, which Canadians observed over this past weekend. I was honoured to lay a wreath on behalf of the Ontario government at the Remembrance Day Cenotaph ceremony in Scarborough Southwest. I'm paying tribute to those who have so bravely served and sacrificed and to do so that we can be free. Mr. Speaker, the, the poem entitled High Flight was written by John Gillespie McGee Jr., who was a fighter pilot that served with the Royal Canadian Air Force in World War II. He died at the age of 19. It has become the official poem of the Canadian Air Force, and I'm going to read it into the record now. High Flight. Oh, I have slipped the sturdy bonds of earth and danced the skies on laughter silvered wings. Somewhere I've climbed and joined the tumbling mirth of sun-split clouds, and done a hundred things you have not dreamed of, wheeled and soared and swung high in the sunlit silence. Hovering there, I've chased the shouting wind along and flung my ear craft through footless halls of air. Up, up the long, delirious, burning blue, I've topped the windswept heights with easy grace, where never lark or even eagle flew. And while with silent lifting mind, I've trod the high, untrespassed sanctity of space, put out my hand and touched the face of God. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Leeds Grenville. Uh, thanks, uh, Speaker. Every day, Ontario's 1,600 optometrists care for one of our most precious gifts, our vision. I was fortunate last week during Optometry Week to visit Dr. Carla Eamon who has operated her Kempville Clinic for 29 years. I had an up-close look at the wonderful care she gives to everyone from babies to seniors in long-term care. It was valuable insight into how much optometrists do in our health care system and why they're eager to do more. Dr. Eamon sees many emergency cases as the local hospital doesn't have a regular ophthalmologist. She also provides the IC I Learn program to junior kindergarten students, 15% of whom need glasses. It's a busy, busy schedule, but she's happy uh, and she'd like to expand her role. Giving optometrists an expanded scope in primary care would reduce wait times and make their practices more viable. That's important because I can't envision a community like Kempville without a, an optometrist. As Dr. Eamon said, quote, in a smaller rural community, why wouldn't we want to take a greater advantage of this resource? Mm -hmm. I agree, and I encourage the health minister to work with the Ontario Association of Optometrists and not turn a blind eye on expanding their scope of practice. Thanks to Dr. Eamon and her staff for their hospitality and for keeping a watchful eye on the vision health of my constituents. Thank well you, Speaker. Done. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. It's therefore time for reports by committees. Report